So it's now my pleasure to introduce a man who needs no introduction, <laughs> the 31st Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral John Richardson. Okay, well, I don't know how to follow that up. Let's give another round of applause for just an amazingly energetic talk by Secretary Lehman. Mr. Secretary, thanks so much, uh, not only for the history, but uh, how it relates today, you know, get, filling our sails with that uh, wind of inspiration. Uh, I'd like to also uh, just recognize, uh, first of all, it's just terrific to be back here in Newport, as always, and I couldn't agree more with Secretary Lehman about what this place means to the Navy and the nation in terms of being just a supernova of intellectual activity. And uh, this current strategy forum, you know, being a, a very bright star in that constellation, and it's just a privilege for me to be here uh, amongst such distinguished company and uh, also the students. Not to say that the students are not distinguished, <laughs> but, uh, they bring a special energy. Ambassador Bindorf, great to see you again, sir. Thanks for joining us today. Let's give a round of applause for his former Secretary of the Navy. <laughs> Admiral Hogg, great to see you again, sir, as always. Uh, uh, yeah, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We have our uh, very well represented by our allies and partners here with uh, Admiral uh, Guillermo Barrera from the Colombian Navy, good to see you again, sir, and also uh, uh, Admiral Verma from the Indian Navy. So uh, we've never fought alone, and uh, we will not fight alone going forward, and it's uh, terrific to have uh, our allies and partners you know, represented so well here, uh, not only in the student body and the faculty, but most especially by our two distinguished uh, guests. Honorable Randy Forbes is uh, here somewhere. Uh, he's on campus. I know, there you are, sir. Good to see you again. And so it's uh, just terrific to address all of you. And, uh, you know, what a timely conference this is right now. And I'm going to, you know, despite the fact that Secretary Lehman stole almost all of my best lines uh, to describe our current situation, I'm going to go forward, and now you know, he, he provided such a terrific strategic overview, going back to that you know, rich time in our strategy in the kind of the Cold War, really the end of the Cold War, you know, the final plays in that huge chess match that brought it to a, a close on, on terms favorable to us. And you know, I hearken back also to where when this place was so vibrant in terms of developing the color plans, you know, War Plan Orange and the interwar period too, just by that, you know, iteration, uh, iterative war games coming back and back and back again uh, to just work our way through to the point that Admiral Nimitz, when he fought World War II, having been to so many of the war games here at the Naval War College, said that nothing in the fight in the Pacific surprised him at all except kamikaze. That was the only thing that really hadn't been foreseen in some form or fashion by virtue of the wargaming process here and developing that war plan. So here we are at the current strategy forum, and uh, I'm going to actually uh, talk a little bit about fleet design and fleet tactics. And uh, so one can, you know, sort of throw me under the bus right away. What are you doing? It's just, why do you want to do that? And I kind of go back to uh, one of my favorite references is uh, Captain Wayne Hughes' uh, seminal book, Fleet Tactics. And uh, in the foreword for that book, another great uh, naval strategist, uh, Art Sabrowski, calls tactics the sum of the art and science of the actual application of combat power, and therefore the soul of our profession. And Wayne Hughes himself argues convincingly in that book for the study of strategy and tactics. And he says this is especially important during periods of transition in naval warfare. And if you've heard me talk any time in the last two years, uh, you know that I think we are, on, we are in the middle of a tremendously uh, changing time, very rapidly changing time, and so very appropriate. Um, you know, he, uh, Captain Hughes observes that the ultimate act of a great transition in the hands 
of a master tactician may be felt like a bolt from the blue. And that's exactly the words that uh, I was thinking about when Secretary Lehman was talking about that great exercise that went up 84 ships north of the GIUK gap, right up into the northern Atlantic, surprising everybody, it sounds like. Uh, what, you know, when you think of a bolt from the blue, that is exactly what, we, uh, what, what comes to mind. And uh, you know, the book goes on to observe that while it takes the work of many from both inside and out of the Navy to navigate through such a transition, uh, the good perspiration always comes from within the Navy when we do this. And so I'm hoping that today at this conference and maybe getting started with this talk, we can see if we can't break a little bit of a sweat. And so with that in mind, I just wanted to share some of my recent thinking on uh, tactics and fleet design. And we'll start with our OODA loop. Now, I think everybody in this room is familiar in one sense or another with John Boyd's OODA loop. Uh, we're comfortable with it as a very tactical thing, you know, uh, even down to an individual, a pilot, let's say, uh, but also sort of as a, a, as a more operational concept or even a staffing process. Uh, and, uh, you know, actually we're a little bit perhaps too comfortable with it. You know, if you read uh, Colonel Boyd, he talks about, hey, this is nothing, you know, that's very deterministic. There's a tremendous amount of ambiguity. Um, there's always, uh, you know, the, our, our mental models uh, will bias us in certain ways, uh, leading us, you know, to that unavoidable fog and friction of war. And so uh, sometimes we oversimplify our OODA loop, but if it's understood as sort of a model, a uh, recipe, if you will, then I think it can describe, it can help us des describe the character of what we do from sort of small group tactics all the way up to the strategic level and help us navigate this transition. Now I've emphasized through my tenure the need to back up a bit and talk about you know, what has changed since the last time we were really in a competition. Uh, and I would have argued that the character of the competition has changed. Certainly the competitors have changed in important ways, but the character of the uh, competition has changed. And I talk about this in the design for maintaining maritime superiority. We talk about a number of forces that are dry changing that character, two of which are the rate of technology creation and then also the rate at which that technology is adopted or embraced by uh, users. And both of those trends really began at the time that Secretary Lehman was talking about in the 80s and 90s. They've had a major impact on our business, uh, characterized by a number of catchphrases, right? Reconnaissance strike network, a revolution of military affairs. You hear a lot of talk about transformation. And uh, in particularly advances in uh, networks and in space have created uh, uh, tremendous opportunities, sort of unprecedented levels of uh, precision. And so in the OODA loop context, you know, our much of that transformation, much of that revolution to date has uh, provided an ISR network that has offered us the opportunity to observe things with a tremendous amount of fidelity and precision. And then when married to precise weapons, it allows us to orient ourselves uh, to translate that into decisions and actions uh, with a whole new level of accuracy. And so I would say, if I can Hopefully this works right, point it at the clock. There we go. So this is sort of where our advantage has been seen to date, all right? And the leverage that the joint force was able to realize has perhaps been the defining characteristic of our military advantage over the past few decades. We were better able to see things better, more precisely than our, uh, our adversaries. That allowed us to more quickly orient and that led to decisions and actions that were you know, better, more precise, and ahead of our competition. And this you know, effectiveness rippled all the way back into our force architectures and design. And we've been optimizing our ability to see better and shoot more accurately ever since. And so much of the uh, uh, air land battle, and you know, this, uh, if you talk about you know, the second offset uh, that uh, Secretary Wirt describes. It is this 
you know, precision strike network. But if you're kind of keeping your ear to the ground right now, I think we can all feel that things are changing. The story didn't stop simply with precision. And the information technology trends of the decades since we were last in a head-to-head -head competition have not only continued, but they've accelerated. And the technical march, technological march, has become much more of a sprint. Just some examples. The cellular phone, okay? It was invented and adopted by uh, the uh, you know, people, the, uh, the population, the users of that phone in about half the time that it took for people to adopt the personal computer. And the personal computer was adopted in about half the time that the, the original cell, the telephone itself was adopted. And of course, you know, that cellular phone brings a tremendous amount more capability to your hand. And so it enabled you know, entire communications and banking uh, capabilities to regions of the world that have never seen you know, a copper wire, have never seen a bank. They can do it all on your phone. Uh, the size of this digital universe into which this phone plugs is doubling every two years. And it will re I'm going to give you a number here, but I have no idea what this really means in practical terms. Uh, it, the, the, number, the amount of information is going to reach 44 zettabytes uh, by 2020. Can, any, any of the students give me a sense of the, what the heck a zettabyte means? Uh, it's an order of magnitude change since 2010. Right? It gives you a sense of how fast things are changing. The Internet of Things. Right? The bringing in of hardware into this uh, digital connection. By the end of this year, we're going to cross the threshold where 20 billion things are connected into that Internet of Things. And it's going to be 30 billion by 2020, and more than double again by 2025. So that's everything from your car to your refrigerator, to your phone, you name it, right? All uh, connected in. And as things get more and more connected, as the information becomes you know, really flowing in a waterfall or an avalanche, it's bringing along with it a brand new age of cognitive computing, you know, decision and cognitive assistance, machine assistance to help us make sense of all that data. Adaptive network sensors are now on the horizon and proliferating. And, so, and you know, a little bit different than maybe perhaps when Secretary Lehman was, was uh, making history, uh, the private sector is leading in a lot of these areas. And uh, the militaries, the Navy, in many of these areas is becoming a fast follower trying to leverage what's going on. So a sense of what's going on in the private sector. Global Fishing Watch is a cooperative venture involving Google. It already uses AIS data and other information from a comparatively low cost satellite constellation to track over 50% of the world's fishing fleets, not only by their location, uh, but also monitoring their behavior. Uh, of the roughly 1,500 operational satellites in orbit today, uh, close to a third of those have been launched in the last seven years. And only about 40% of what's in orbit right now was launched by the United States. So now you've got to think about what this means. All of those sensors in space, on our phones, in our homes. You know, I, used, I tell people, I, I teach a lot. I really enjoy teaching command. In fact, I'm going to spend you know, the afternoon over at the Navy Leadership and Ethics Center. And we talk a lot about ethics. And we, you know, there's this sense that uh, there, there, there's a sense, of, a false sense of privacy. And if, uh, how, how many people here have a uh, Facebook account? OK. OK. Uh, how many people don't have a Facebook account? All right. So. See, it's always interesting in these crowds. There's always kind of the, you know, if I asked that at a college, it would be 
everybody but one person, you know, would have a Facebook account. Here, there's always a little bit of hesitation about that level of exposure. And, uh, but I'll tell you, you know, uh, you just have to watch the news to see that, uh, you know, criminal behavior, un undesired behavior, oftentimes is caught on some kind of a sensor. So all of these things are, uh, are proliferating around, uh, literally everywhere. It means that you know, this idea of that first O in the OODA loop, the observe stage, is really becoming ubiquitous. And I think that that has tremendous implications for how we do business. In the near future, I hypothesize, I propose that just about anybody is going to be able to see almost anything anywhere in the world on demand. In fact, it's going to be much more, well, it's going to be as accessible to my daughter on her cell phone as it is going to be to my son, a Navy lieutenant, in a skiff. In fact, if we don't attack some of these things that Secretary Lehman talked about, my daughter's probably going to be a couple of days ahead of my son <laughs> in the Navy skiff uh, because she won't have, you know, anywhere near as many, many crazy firewalls to break through to get to the information. Now, you know, we might not be able to read somebody's driver's license from space with those sensors, but we can, they will be able to detect ships. They will be able to detect things at tactically relevant scale. They'll be able to detect cars. They'll be able to detect changes in cars, right? How many cars are in a particular parking lot? Uh, and they'll be able to do that automatically. They won't need a person to examine that. They'll have an algorithm that can do all that. Uh, they'll be able to detect the level of petroleum in storage tanks because they can measure the tops of those tanks. They can do all that and measure those. They'll know when a particular country gets below its 20% of its strategic reserve in petroleum because they're tracking that with a machine. They're taking the imagery and processing it by a machine. And so it's sifting through that, all of that data to be able to rapidly understand the operational environment and discern those changes is now going to be the critical part of orienting. So as we gather here in Newport, the, the information environment, the pace of change, you know, the word that's used to describe that more and more is exponential. Okay, the exponential pace of change. And we're familiar with this idea. We kind of, we live in it, right? Uh, we download apps, we, we have smart houses, smart cars, smart phones, smart everything. Uh, but in terms of our business and fleet design, we may not have yet fully appreciated its impact, uh, which were to date underpinned by superior access to data and a presumed advantage that it has in a, in a military application. So the idea here that I propose for you, one of the ideas, is that this era of precision, precision and observation, is giving way uh, to an era of competition for decision, okay? In fact, uh, it's moving over. That's the new contest. Observation, that information is going to be ubiquitous. It's going to be on demand. Uh, it's already being eroded, you know, our, our, our uh, observational advantage. And in an era which is, in which CubeSat, CubeSats are being launched into space, uh, zettabytes of information available, uh, the advantage boils down not to who gets the data, the information, but who can make better sense of it who can orient themselves better and make a better decision, okay? Observation has become synonymous with the physical orientation. The sensors now are omnipresent, and the positioning information is embedded. And so now the competition shifts to orienting, finding your way through that information, and making a decision. So what does this mean for the Navy? I mean, this is a great theoretical uh, construct, uh, but we're here at the Naval War College. Well, I will tell you, I'll just pile on to Secretary Lehman's comments. We no longer have the luxury 
of moving slowly. Okay, we have, I mean, it is an imperative to speed up. And we also no longer have the luxury of just leaving our information and data unexamined. Okay, we gather a lot of data, but as you look around the Navy right now, we're not taking full advantage of it. And we can't expect to keep pace in an exponential environment with linear and evolutionary improvements by applying analog processes in a digital world. Uh, we haven't been in true competition for a generation. And when we were in competition last, as I said, you know, the, the competition was for observation superiority, precision. But the, this OODA loop, I would argue, is still relevant, uh, but it's the, per, you know, it's the team that orients and decides better that's going to win. And another dimension of an exponential competition, uh, there is no silver medal. There is no bronze medal. It is winner take all, okay? And so we want to be the one on the podium. So how quickly we move to connect distributed sensors capable pay to capable payloads uh, in the middle, you know, with orienting and deciding, that's going to determine whether we prevail in this new era of competition. And we must, you know, it, and it's not, it's an additive challenge, right? It's not like we can abandon precision as we do this. We have to continue to protect our precision capabilities, our command, our control, our sensor networks, our weapons networks. Those have all got to be made resilient and survivable. Uh, but to, kin to continue to put our, all of our money on the bet of superior observation is, I would argue, a losing strategy. Okay, so I recently put out a paper that talked about how to move towards a future Navy. And it, it adopts a lot of the concepts and the ideas that Secretary Lehman proposed. In fact, there's no, that's not an accidental thing. That book that was up there, I read that book. And, uh, you know, I've, Secretary Lehman and I talk often, and I just stole his ideas. All right? So, uh, a lot, you know, it's the sincerest form of uh, flattery, sir, it's just an imitation. And so I thought I'd walk you through this uh, with just uh, a couple of graphs. So here's a chart from the paper. Uh, let me go back. Well, there we go. So this is a description of a, a summary slide that talks about you know, the output of a number of studies that we've undertaken and other people have undertaken over the past year or so. And along the uh, axis is uh, is uh, the year you can see, and then you can see sort of a you know, force building, numbers of ships growing over time. And uh, there is a good consensus of studies that say that the size of the Navy, well, first of all, there's near unanimity, unanimous consensus that we need more Navy, okay? This is a conclusion by every one of the studies. And there is also a consensus around 350. Okay, uh, 355, 350, mid 300s in terms of this, the number of platforms that uh, this, this Navy should grow towards. And so these are some of you know, the trajectories that have emerged from those. And it is exactly like Secretary Lehman said. We, you know, we're rhyming with history. It's just as he describes. Somewhere out in 2040, uh, we start to approach 350 platforms. Uh, that's using sort of current ideas, traditional thinking, you know, the, 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 the bureaucratic approach that defines our acquisition processes right now. Uh, the problem is that we, this is the Navy we need. We need that capability, uh, but we need that now. We need to start building towards that right now. How do we accelerate our way forward so that we get this Navy we need at the time that we need it, all right? How to get there. And so I've got a couple of cartoons that propose an approach, and I'm gonna, I've got about an hour talk. I'll talk for 59 minutes and leave the last 50 seconds or so for questions. Uh, but I would like to engage in a dialogue about, you know, what do you think about this idea? So we'll start 
was just sort of a cartoon about a fleet, okay? And the capability of that fleet sort of roughly goes up, you know, somewhat linearly over the number of platforms. So you can see naval power on the y-axis, the vertical axis, as the number of platforms on the x-axis grows, the, uh, the naval power grows. And this is sort of a description of, let's say, our current fleet, okay? So let's move forward. How do we gain, you know, how do we get from linear to exponential? How do we get to that naval power that we need at the time that we need it? Well, just as Secretary Lehman said, uh, we can build stuff. We can get more platforms. And uh, so if, if we do that, there's a picture of more platforms, okay, a bigger navy, and there's a description of what that, those more platforms can get. And as just as Secretary Lehman said, uh, some of that is going to come from surface life extension, right? If we plan now, for instance, to extend the life of the Arleigh Burke DDGs uh, beyond you know, their, their current projections, you know, the initial returns are that we could buy 10 to 15 years to the left in terms of reaching that 350 ship goal, all right? And so we're looking at every trick, extending lives, bringing ships back, you know, we'll do, it, we'll do everything it takes to bring more platforms and then of course, uh, we can have a discussion about new acquisitions and how those new acquisitions should be done so that we can keep a fleet that's relevant or as far out as we can see. Okay, so one way to grow that naval power is to just build more platforms. Okay, and then there is another thing. So if you look at the uh, cartoons, there's sort of a circle radius that talks about the, represents the capability of each of the, one of those platforms. Uh, but you can put things on those platforms, you can modernize them to make them each more capable, all right? So now you've got not only more platforms, but each of those platforms individually is more capable, and they add up to yet a more, more naval power, all right? So you've got this growing naval power there uh, by adding more platforms and then making each of those platforms more capable. What sort of technologies are, will do this? Well, I think that uh, you know, between more platforms and more capable platforms, uh, unmanned and autonomous technologies are, are, are right around the corner being employed. I would think that, uh, well, directed energy is, uh, is a technology that can uh, make platforms significantly more capable and at a cost that's uh, much more reasonable. Uh, it gets us on the right side of the cost curve in many ways. There are those types of technologies that are out there, imaging radars, uh, those sorts of things that uh, can make each of these platforms more capable, delivering more naval power. The final step then is to network them all together. Now this is greater than linear, I would argue. And uh, this is you know where we need to get the theorists together. Uh, but I would say that by taking more platforms, more capable uh, capability on each of those platforms and networking them together, you start to now see that exponential growth as that networked fleet can combine in you know, adaptive and creative ways. And uh, you know, this place more than any uh, knows that you know, many of those revolutions in military affairs, uh, some of them were brought about by the introduction of new technologies, but many of them, in fact, many of the most decisive ones were brought about not by a new technology in and of itself, but by new combinations of things. And so by allowing these combinations, by networking these, uh, the fleet together, you start to now see how this naval power can grow near exponentially, matching this exponential environment, delivering us that Navy that we need at the time that we need it, okay? So this is the idea. Uh, let's go back to our, uh, our slide build. You know, it's not, just, uh, it's not just the fact that we've got to, to, to do the right thing. You know, we'll go back to fleet tactics. Captain Hughes says again, you know, throughout history, 
The genius of winning sea battles has not so much been knowing what to do as when to do it. And Arleigh Burke, in his, in, in, as only he could do, boiled that down to a phrase. He, he said, the difference between a good and a great naval officer is about 10 seconds. <laughs> All right? You've got to be able to do this as, you know, faster, than, faster and better than the enemy. So we'll go back to our UDA slide here. So we'll take this and we'll spin it on its head a little bit. And uh, now you start to see how this breaks down. And you know, think about that interconnected, more capable fleet. Uh, all of those sensors that we talked about, right, the, the ubiquitous sensing environment, uh, you start to see uh, an environment emerge where, you know, if you think about hardware as a service, software as a service, uh, we have a fleet commander now who can really literally think of sensors as a service. Okay, and how many of those sensors can you network into that maritime operations center for him to take advantage of? That will be his you know, avalanche of information, that, that or, uh, observing phase of the step. And then, you know, you go, again, go back to that picture. Each of those platforms can deliver a payload those payloads are a combination of kinetic and non-kinetic payloads. And, he's, and those payloads are also part of that network. They are wired in, right? Their sensors are wired in, and they are receiving information. They're both contributing to and receiving from that uh, network. And so you see now that payloads emerge as a service. Payloads as a service. That is your act part. And the battle space here now is in terms of orienting and deciding. And this is where we've got to pay a lot of attention. How do, first of all, it raises a tremendous amount of questions. Uh, if we agree, and I'm not saying that we do, that uh, this observation, you know, we're going to be under near constant observation, uh, what does that mean in terms of the way we train and exercise? All right? I mean, if you're going to get ready for the big game on Sunday, uh, how do you prepare for that game when you've got the competition watching all your practices during the week? It's different than it was when they weren't there. Uh, what does that mean for operational deception? Right? <laughs> Secretary Lehman talked about the importance of deception uh, in that great bolt out of the blue. Uh, what does this ubiquitous observation mean for operational deception? How do you deceive under constant observation? Where do you want that orienti orienting and deciding happening? Do you want that at the unit command level? Do you want that at the strike group level, uh, the individual level, the fleet command level? Where do we build the tools to orient and decide? So, you know, a lot of questions. A question, you know, that's why I bring this talk here, because this is the place to ask a lot of questions and get them answered, all right? So I just want to leave you with a couple things. One, we're back in competition for the first time, really, in a generation. Uh, the good news is, as Secretary Lehman said, there's a tremendously growing realization of that and the conditions are right to maintain our, our lead in that competition, maintain our superiority. Uh, but we've, I hope I've instilled in you a sense that the character of the game has changed. We can talk about the competitors. It's always, I know I'll get questions about the four plus one. I always do. Uh, but you know, to, if we don't understand that, that changing character, it doesn't matter, you know, position by position, we could have the best defense in the NFL, but if we are not ready for the no-huddle offense, we're just going to fall into disarray further and further with every play as we are called for too many men on the field, as we're out of position when the ball snaps and the other team walks into the end zone against ostensibly the most powerful and maybe irrelevant defense in the league. 
I hope I've instilled in you that we've got to capture this changing character and get moving with a sense of urgency, a sense of immediacy. This is not something that can wait until 2040 to get going. We've got to make these moves now. We've got to make them boldly. And so I look forward to hearing the insights of not only the current strategy forum, but continuing to work closely with the minds here at the Naval War College as we wrestle with this period of transition, as we work at the close interconnection of tactics, operations, and strategy uh, in crafting our fleet design, moving towards that 350 ship platform Navy that will continue to make us the most powerful maritime power in the, earth, in the world. Thank you all very much, and I look forward to your questions. I think there's some rules here. We've got to find the most junior person to ask the first question. Lieutenant Colonel Tracy, United States Marine Corps. Very excited your presentation on Colonel Boyd and his philosophy. I completely concur that this is the wave of the future. However, I've wrestled with this problem and looked at it over the past year, and I've concluded that our service cannot execute this policy and this philosophy. The reason for that, I believe, is mired in uh, what I call the three Ms. Our service today is modern, vice postmodern. It's mechanistic and it's Mahanian, in that we have trained ourselves to seek a correct solution, vice being more postmodern and being comfortable in the fluidity and exponentiality of the potentials of these technologies. Do you believe that that assessment is one, incorrect, and if two, if it is correct, then how do we change the culture and philosophy of our service to accept this? Well, I, I uh, you know, it's sort of as is and to be, right? As is, I think a lot of what you says uh, resonates, but first of all, don't be busting on my hand. We're gonna have to... <laughs> Not here, <laughs> all right? <laughs> and uh, then, uh, you know, our service literally is what we make it. Right? And so uh, I will tell you that uh, of, of the ingredients in the mix of everything that we have to do, uh, the most important ingredient is a sense of urgency and paranoia. Uh, with that, we can move mountains. Uh, unless we get that, we're going to continue to be comfortable and complacent. And you know, we'll be mechanistic, and we'll be slow, and we'll be non-exponential. Uh, I'll tell you, um, you know, a lot of the books that uh, are read in academic institutions about competition, um, they're, they're uh, business books, aren't they? Right? You, you talk about uh, a lot of what's going on in business, uh, particularly in a lot of these startups in Silicon Valley. And that's because, well, they're interesting because they're you know, victory is the margins of victory there. The margins of survival or capitulation are razor thin, right? They, they understand this competition a lot more viscerally than we do. Uh, and, uh, you know, while those startup things are sort of the latest uh, manifestation of that, maybe the more academically interesting, uh, there's an awful lot of corporations that look a lot like us. Uh, they have a lot of capital. They bring a great legacy and tradition. And they are modernizing and they are adapting and continuing to dominate the competition. Uh, you just probably read in the last couple days that uh, Jeffrey Immelt is stepping down as the CEO of uh, General Electric. Boy, what a company that is, right? I mean, GE, I think, is the only company that was on the original Dow uh, Jones that, that is still there, all right? And they have almost completely transformed themselves in the last 10 years under uh, Mr. Immelt's leadership. And so this can be done. Uh, 
but it's going to take leadership and it's going to take a sense of urgency by everybody involved. It's going to take alliance, alignment, and everybody pushing on this thing. This is not something where you, know, you should feel yourself pulled along. If you're not pushing, then you're in the wrong organization. So I, today, looking back, a lot of what you said checks, checks with the chart. By right, going forward, it doesn't have to be that way. Secretary Lehman proved it. He built 600 ship Navy. All right, it can be done. All right, next question. It's a question back here, I think. Sir, thank you. I'm from Special Operations Command, so my question will go in that direction. What I took away from your chart was that the sensors and the networked uh, ability to fight a problem globally, which is where we hear the chairman is going, is equally, if not more important than the platforms for that competitive advantage. So to get back to competition, it seems to me some of our smaller teams and unique capabilities could be better integrated, uh, soft specifically, rather than looking at it as a CT capability. How do you pull those things in for that unique game changer capability going forward, uh, as opposed to uh, you know, what's the trans transformational next step that our first uh, question from the Marine yeah. focused on? Well, I'll tell you, uh, I'll, I'll stick to the network. Uh, and. Um, you know, what we do, I mean, we're working very hard on this in the Navy, and I hope that that is felt up here at the Naval War College. And it's just as you said, so oftentimes we'll put together the plan, and if we aren't careful that, uh, hey, we'll get to the information part of the plan or, you know, the digital part, the cyber part, whatever you want, you know, however you want to do it, the electromagnetic maneuver warfare part of the plan, after the cake is baked, right? We'll take it out of the oven and it's like, oh, like, whoops, you know, we forgot this and we'll try and frost something over it. I would, you know, if we're not careful, special operations can be the same way. And so uh, we just have to be uh, careful to include, you know, that whole thing in our planning. Now, you mentioned the chairman and his uh, idea of this global uh, approach that he's taken. Um, you know, what he means there is that by virtue of a lot of these technologies, you know, nothing is truly regional anymore, is it? Right? It really is sort of very interconnected and global. Uh, some things more global than others. You know, if you talk about a competitor like Russia and China, they can bring a lot more tools, a lot more global tools uh, to the table than, some, than a competitor like Iran and North Korea. But even those latter two, you know, it would be a mistake, I think, to call them just a regional challenge. And so, and then, you know, of course, space and cyber two war fighting domains, operational domains that weren't even around, you know, last time we were competing. And so uh, uh, yeah, that, that's, I think, a little bit more what, what the chairman is talking about in terms of uh, this impact of this technology in, in making things not regional but much more uh, trans-regional, okay? But we've got to kind of get, you know, the, all of the special operations, cyber, information, all of those things, those new dimensions, space, you know, it's like conducting two or three orchestras at one time, and everything has to be done very precisely. It's, you know, so the, again, you know, you go back, Secretary Lehman talked about the importance of war games. What better place to talk about that than here? You know, we've got to be war gaming that level of complexity uh, so that we get the C2 right and the timing down uh, so that when the authorities come, we'll have done our homework and be ready to go. What other question? Over here. Lieutenant Max Reipel at U.S. Navy. For the 350 ship Navy, I know you didn't mention pulling ships out of mothballs. That's obviously probably the fastest way. How do you see the balance between numbers and capabilities? Yeah, now that's always the question, right? So uh, we've got to be thoughtful about this. Um, you know, in this exponential world, a lot has changed. So the ones that are sort of the ones that we're taking a hard look at are the Oliver Hazard Perry class frigates. There's seven or eight of those that I think we could take a look at. Uh, but, well, those, those are some old ships, and the technology on those ships is, is old. <clears throat> and uh, in these exponential types of, uh, of environments, you know, a lot has changed since we last modernized those. 
And so it, it, it'll be a cost-benefit analysis in terms of how, how we do that. Uh, the other part is just life extension. So we sort of plan to keep them out of mothballs longer. And uh, that, uh, we, that's going to be, I think, money in the bank if we do that. Okay, so there's, it's really a cost-benefit analysis in terms of how much does it cost to modernize these things, make them relevant uh, for the amount of life that we're going to get out of them, and then uh, we'll see how that goes. Okay? Sir? Yeah, class of 93. I had the great privilege of deploying with the Kearsarge LHD-3 under Captain Larry Getz. And we were the sole big deck operating uh, in that operating area of the Gulf, um, proving to my mind that uh, an LHD with, with its capability of flight ops and, and the MU is a good uh, solution to freeing up some of our large deck carriers to go into other areas. I'd like to suggest and take this opportunity to promote the idea that we need to build some new LHD-3s with increased capability. You know, you'll hear, I think uh, the Commandant's on the agenda later on, and so uh, he and I are working uh, you know, very closely uh, to make sure that we take a look at you know, naval power and uh, what those big deck amphibs can bring, particularly as you bring a, an aircraft like the uh, F-35B on board that. And so uh, it brings a, an entirely new capability set to that formation and provides us, you bring it into that network I was talking about, uh, with the, just the progress of technology, you can put pretty near an Aegis combat system, you know, in, in a couple of racks of gear now, and uh, now you're talking about a whole new game there. So I agree with you. Yeah. Sir. Uh, what do you see as the uh, big challenges for the Navy over the next 10 or 15 years? What have I been, I've been talking for 47 minutes about the, uh, it's, it's, it's uh. No, but what I mean by that is, who are our adversaries? What are their capabilities? How do we have to position ourselves? Yeah. Um, well, I, you know, again, I think uh, some of the capabilities that we talked about uh, highlight implicitly what our challenges are. But, you know, I wrote a piece not too long ago that uh, sort of advocated that we stop using this A2AD term, right? And uh, it's not that it's not, you know, a good term. Uh, well, actually, it's not a good term. But um, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's like going to the doctor and getting the diagnosis, hey, I think you're sick, you know? It's like, well, thanks. Uh, I was hoping for something a little more useful, you know? Um, every one of those... Uh, uh, anti-access area denial approaches, you know, they're very tailored to the threat, to the geography, you know. And so I think that uh, decomposing that is going to, you know, as observation becomes more and more ubiquitous and more and more precise, as the weapons become longer range, uh, you know, there's gonna, be con there's gonna be contests. There's gonna be contests in space. There's gonna be contests for access as we move into each of those kind of reconnaissance strike networks. And decomposing each one of those things is going to be you know, the challenge. We, it's been some time since we've been challenged for uh, sea control. And a lot of times when we think of the traditional battle for sea control, it's sort of fleet on fleet. Uh, what does that mean? You know, another ancient adage is, you know, fleets don't fight forts. Well, what, what happens when that fort can reach out 1,500 miles? Uh, that, you know, that's, a, that's a big challenge, okay? Sir. Sir, how do we um, convince a civilian population uh, that, um, how do we engender this essential sense of urgency in a civilian population that pays the bills and yet seems naive to the fact that you can be paranoid and still have enemies? Well, um, you know, another great uh, competitor in the, uh, uh, the private sector was a guy named Andy Grove. Uh, he came over uh, from Hungary and uh, educated himself and uh, went on to be the CEO of Intel. And he wrote a book, uh, well, he, you know, he could have written a, 
a number of books, right? If you think about his life, and he, he did write a number. Uh, he wrote one on management, which is a fascinating book, High Output Management. He also wrote a book called Only the Paranoid Survive. And so we should uh, embrace our paranoia. Uh, but in terms of energizing the population, I think it's really just a matter of talking to them, right? I mean, uh, and I wouldn't take for granted that uh, anybody knows the challenges that face us. Uh, you get out of the academic circles of Newport and the War College, you get outside the Beltway, uh, uh, it, you know, pe different things are on people's minds, right? And so uh, you just have to, I, I, the first part is just talk to them. Uh, we, I do a lot of discussions with our partners on uh, Capitol Hill. Uh, Congressman Forbes is you know, one of those great partners. Boy, every venue, I think we need to uh, you know, go out and, and educate people. So all of the chambers of commerce, all of the PTAs, the Rotary Clubs, the, you, know, you name it. Uh, don't miss an opportunity to talk about some of these challenges that we face in the international world and just make sure, you know, make sure that it's on people's minds. My name's Robert Berliner. Um, many years ago when I still had hair, I served as supply officer on the Henry L. Stimson. Um, and I am curious about two things. One is there seems to be an assumption, assumption in the first observation um, phase that everybody has access to the same sensors. So that raises two questions to me. One, is there an opportunity for our forces to be more, less observable, which probably means more underwater um, forces. And is there also an opportunity to interfere with our adversaries' uh, sensor transmission uh, capabilities? Uh, yeah, yes and yes. Um, <laughs> uh, sort of easy questions. Um, but the, uh, the hard part is, you know, how? And uh, so, you know, it, it'd be tempting for a guy like me to submerge everything, right? Uh, <laughs> and, uh, sort of, that's sort of my, where I was yeah. headed. But uh, you know, the other thing that uh, is really terrific about being in the Navy and why you know, I would argue with anybody that uh, you know, tries to downplay the relevance of navies is that, um, you know, it is absolutely necessary but not sufficient to be a consummate warfighter uh, to be a, you know, in the Navy, because Navies do so much more than that. And so uh, you know, there is the diplomatic element of being in the Navy, which is you know, just a terrific part of what we do. Uh, there's these long-term shaping, cer certainly we do crisis response. You know, our presence and our capability there provides national leadership, you know, timely, incredible options to respond to a crisis, whether that's a humanitarian crisis, whether that is a security crisis, whatever. And hopefully by virtue of that response, you know, we can mitigate and prevent that crisis from escalating. We can contain it. Uh, so that's our sort of very rapid, high bandwidth contribution. On the other end, you know, by virtue of that long-term presence, uh, working with allies and partners, advocating for uh, norms and you know the rule of law, et cetera, uh, <coughs> advocating for our values. Uh, there is that long-term shaping function, and you know you can't do any of that unless you're up and you're uh, you're you're engaging, right? So there's so much more to a navy than just uh, the absolute necessity of being able to fight and win at sea. And so uh, I think it would be uh, incomplete to just you know, try and, and submerge everything. Um, and then uh, it does get into that middle section. Uh, it's not so much you know, the, uh, the observation. As I said, it's you know, how, do you orient, how do you detect what's normal? How do you know what's normal? And then how do you detect what's a departure from normal, something that I need to respond to? All right, That's that middle part. And that, we need to do it to our adversaries. We need to understand that they're going to be doing it to us. 
We need to understand that culturally, some of our competitors are centuries ahead of us in this uh, deception world. And so uh, need to be thoughtful about that. All right, anybody over here? Sir. Okay, I'll tell you what. Uh, I get out around our Navy quite a bit. And, um, you know, it kind of goes back to this uh, question that talks about agility, uh, dynamic, you know, uh, uh, the ability to adapt, uh, focus. Uh, our Navy gets an A in that regard. They are doing terrific work out there. You know, the operational fleet uh, had a great... Uh, visit to Rota, Spain not too long ago. It was, just, you know, it was, in fact, it was the week before the strikes into Syria. And I wanted to go see the Eastern Mediterranean, you know, it's part of this changing environment. The Eastern Mediterranean is a pretty sporty place to operate these days. And I visited the USS Ross, uh, one of our FDNF ships in Rota. And, uh, I just wanted to, you know, they were getting ready to go on one of their patrols, about four month patrol. I wanted to make sure that one, you know, their heads were in the game, wanted to talk to them, wanted to talk to their sailors, wanted to see their systems, understand material condition, et cetera. And uh, one, you know, there was, it became clear some of the long term uh, influences of being in a resource constrained environment, you know, where people are into, you know, mitigating and minimizing problems and all that. The mindset of restraint, you know, restrained resources is different than the mindset of growth where people are seeking opportunities and creativity and all of that. And so, you know, there was a little bit of that threat. Uh, but boy, the sailors were completely engaged and ready for what they were doing. I, they gave me their brief from their previous patrol in the Mediterranean uh, with pictures of, you know, the Russian carrier Kuznetsov doing flight operations and strikes into Syria. Uh, with the Kirov in the background, that, you know, et cetera, et cetera, things that we haven't seen in a long time. And they were just, you know, adapting on the fly. But as I was touring around, it was uh, GM2 Smith, second class gunner's mate, showing me the Tomahawk cells, the VLS cells. And he was walking me through how he had, you know, that was his station. And he knew his business. You know, he was an expert in what he did. And he said, you know, Admiral, I just, I, he gave a great presentation. He said, but I have a question for you. Uh, can I ask you a question? I said, you know, of course, GMT, you can ask me a question. He said, I've been just taking care of these missiles for so long. And, uh, you know, getting them, keeping them ready, and they are ready to go. And am I ever going to get a chance to use them? <laughs> and, uh, and I said, well, I said, uh, well, GN2 Smith, here's what I can guarantee you. Uh, when the call comes for you to do your job and employ these missiles, it's going to come without warning and preparation. It's going to be on a very short timeline, and we're going to expect you to execute with perfection. Okay? So that I can be, I can, you take that to the bank. Right? So he's like, okay. Within a week, he'd shot 30 of them, right? <laughs> so, so I was back in my office by that time. I was thinking, I'm pretty damn good. <laughs> so, uh, so we, you know, the CEO and I uh, made a nice connection there on board, and he sent me a picture of the uh, missiles leaving the tube, right? And you, many of you probably saw those. They were terrific pictures. The strike happened at night. And so the boosters lit up the sky, you know, and uh, some of them had the American flag there. And so they were you know, just great Navy patriotic pictures. So uh, I took one of those and I, you know, had it blown up on a screen and I put that outside my office in the Pentagon. And uh, then I went out and stood next to it and had a picture taken of me with the picture, right? <laughs> And then I emailed that whole thing back to GM2 Smith and said, watch what you ask me. <laughs> so. so 
So folks like Pastor Smith, they get an A. They're doing their job. Uh, we need to help them, right? Uh, back here in Washington, and uh, you know, as I've testified and I've said this on the record, it, there's a growing sense that we don't get it, right? And we've got to overcome that. We have to close that gap. We have to resource our Navy. We have to reduce the bureaucracy. We have to move faster, and then we'll be getting an A, you know, across the whole organization. But those sailors operating those ships, submarines, aircraft, networks, teams, that, that's an A team. All right, thank you all very much. So we're gonna go ahead and take a 20 minute break so we set up for the next panel. So let's please be back in our seats at 10.20.